Hello, how are you? Welcome. It's great to have you both here. Then it's this nice is, to be back. Yeah, it's, and uh, Steve, I, we woke to the news about uh, a little bit more than a month ago, I guess now, that yeah. uh, someone, a very familiar face to people here in the Seattle startup scene was going to be, uh, become the new CEO of one of the most influential uh, companies in the cloud, really. Um, and so it's a, it's a pleasure to have you both here. Thank you very much. Yeah. So, I mean, I'd, well, I'd like to talk a little bit about where you are right now. You know, mm -hmm. Docker's... The incredible grassroots adoption. I mean, it's one of the fastest, fast, most quickly adopted enterprise technologies I can think of over the last couple of years. And, um, you know, it's not really a new story, I guess, anymore, which is both good and bad, right? It, it, it means that you've, you know, you've, you've won the hearts of a lot of developers and organizations who are re-architecting uh, their application development process around Docker containers. But you've attracted a lot of uh, followers and a lot of other people who are who are looking to piggyback on that momentum to sell more elevated products and services. So, I mean, we're, first of all, I guess, where do you see yourself now? You know, where, like right now in the history of Docker, like what's the most important things on your mind? And then, like, where are you looking? What what's on? If you could just lay out the three-year product roadmap for all of us, that'd be great. Yeah. <laughs> I'll send the budget over as well. Um, <laughs> So I think that um, uh, Ben and Solomon, Scott, obviously, and the rest of the Docker team um, over the last four years have done an amazing job in, in delivering a set of uh, services, I'm used to thinking in terms of cloud, set of services that have really enabled um, a really wide range of, of people to, to say, look, I can build value on top of this. In fact, the, the, the incredible advantage of Docker is is the adoption and, and frankly the standardization that it's driven. And so when you look at the number of de developers that are on it, number of DevOps uh, folks that are on it, it's enviable. And it's one of the things that attracted me uh, to Docker. Um, I think the part that is not as well understood about Docker is the value it can deliver to a corporate customer. And I think this is the, the, the area that over the next three, four, five years you're gonna see us focus on. And that doesn't mean that we don't have an ongoing focus on developers and, and DevOps. In fact, that's, that's how we deliver value uh, to the enterprise. But if you think about this, there's like several comments in the last session around this idea of a hybrid cloud world. I, look, I, um, I spent 24 years in enterprise software. Um, the last two and a half or so in, uh, in enterprise software, one of the largest enterprise software companies in the world, right, SAP. And so I had a chance to, to meet with CIOs, chance to meet with the executives that are running um, uh, IT operations. And what you see in this is this is a really complex hybrid model. Um, there is no, it's all AWS. There is no, it's all Microsoft or all Google Cloud or, or whatever. Um, and for lots of reasons, not the least of which is there's a lot of practical applications and services that actually have to be on-prem. They're just, they're, they're better. Uh, performance, the better results uh, being on-prem. And so if we think about where the world moves, it has to move to a model that embraces all clouds. And I think this is where Docker has an amazing opportunity. Now, we have a lot of work to do, but it has an amazing opportunity against that. I mean, in terms of delivering the value to the, the corporate customers, I, I think is the way you put it, um, there are a lot of people who are doing that with Docker. It's, they're just not Docker. Um, you know, we've seen a lot of other companies gain a lot of momentum, you know, building extended services around containers and around what you've been doing. And I think, you know, the response to Kubernetes, for instance, yeah. is, you know, it seems almost as strong an adoption curve as, as yeah. Docker itself was back, at, you know, when containers were first getting going. Yeah, so how, whoop. yeah it might be. Sorry. Um, That's not your fault, Steve, don't worry. <laughs> okay, um, yeah, do we want to get Steve a new mic? Okay. No, it's okay. good now. Okay, so so it. my question is basically, how do you break through? There's th these people that are providing services um, around Kubernetes, around Mesos, around you know some of the things that Red Hat is and, doing. And Scott, feel free to jump in anywhere you like. But, but yeah. Yeah. oh, how, how's this? Got a is this better for you? Steve? Yeah, he's got it. We'll see. We'll see how it goes. Okay. And we'll jump so, that in. Scott, jump in anywhere you like. But but Tom, here's the thing: if it's a gargantuan market, you're going to have a lot of players in it. Right? And so when you, let's look at Amazon, just AWS for a second. You're talking about a business in, in, in cloud infrastructure that is somewhere in the neighborhood of, what, 14 billion run rate in the most recent quarter? 
And that sounds gargantuan, in fact it is gargantuan, but it's compared to a market that's measured in a few trillion. Right? So when you think about it from that point of view, any market that, that, that is that large is gonna have a lot of competitors that go after it. Now, I, 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 um, as much as I'd like no competition in life, that's just not a uh, uh, you know, realistic scenario. I think the way we think about it and the way I'd encourage you to think about it is that the value for Docker is that that uh, container uh, 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 platform, the Docker container platform, is becoming the standard. And how you build around it, my feeling is if somebody's better than us, wonderful. They should be able to beat us. I'm, I'd like to think that we can out-innovate, uh, even in a, in, a, in a world where uh, much of this has become open source. Now, I'll double down on Steve's point about the Docker container being the baseline for these workloads. And if you look at that through the lens of the previous question about hybrid, we see 75% of our enterprise deployments, enterprise deployments as hybrid deployments, meaning two, at least two clouds and on-prem. And so if that is becoming the corporate standard, the requirement, we think Docker's in a very good place to, yeah. to make a good business on top of that, a great it, business on top of that. And just to expand on that point, is that actually something you hear from customers as a requirement, like that they, they are implementing a best practice within their own organization where you know, we have some of our workloads on-prem, but then we also have, they're just thinking about it that way so, in terms of having multi-cloud. Look, I have a view on this, and, and I respect that, that there's a lot of public cloud providers that have a different view on it. Um, and that's what makes life great, because you can have lots of different views on this, and, and, and we'll see which, where this goes. So the last two weeks I've spent with CIOs, literally at some of the biggest companies in the world. Um, two and a half years prior to that, that's what I was doing as well. In the last two weeks, I, I said, look, walk me through what you're doing in your data centers. How much of that are you gonna keep in-house? How much of that are you gonna to move to an AWS or an Azure or a Google Cloud, or for that matter, an Ali Cloud, right? Or I guess it's Alibaba Cloud now. Um, and, and then tell me how you wanna manage this. The, even at the CIO level, there's a absolute understanding. Um, I think Barb mentioned this and, and, and your uh, prior guest uh, mentioned this as well. There's the, the memory of, of the IT buyer is very long, right? And, and I will tell you, I, at SAP, I sat around listening to um, uh, renewal of licenses from various uh, uh, companies that we built our technology on top of, and that was not a beautiful experience. And so, so the, the, the thing here is that the IT shop looks at and says, says I do want a multi-cloud world. The other part that I think is, is important is that if you think about, right now all we're talking about is, is really in the, in the core of the, of the network. We haven't even gotten to the edge of the network. We haven't even gotten to how, I would say 50% of data will be created at the edge of the network over time. And so how does that get managed? How does the, how does the application framework for that get managed and integrated back into, into the core? And I think this is where uh, a, 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 a container platform for a hybrid cloud world becomes really interesting. And what, you know, what product will you deliver that through then, I guess? Is that, is that something that Swarm will evolve to? I haven't heard Swarm used as an edge computing story. I don't know if that's I think you should think about the Docker platform available yeah. in the core and on the edge. Okay. Yeah, so I guess getting down to sort of brass tacks on that, how will Docker make money in the future? What, what, as Tom's mentioning, there are a lot of people making money on the platform, on the technology. What, what is your primary strategy for, for generating revenue for this company? Yeah, so the, I, I, I was also one of the first, first questions I had before taking on the job was, how do you make money in an open source world? That's um, right, yeah. And, and I think we, we, we just, um, well, first of all, let's talk to um, Amazon. They make a lot of money in an open source world. It's just everybody else is open source te um, uh, technologies. Um, look, at this, think of open source as, as driving adoption, driving standardization, and frankly, embracing the ingenuity uh, of the world. Anybody can uh, contribute to it. And so what it, one of the things it does is drives acceleration in, in innovation. And that doesn't mean all innovation is done in open source only. Uh, there's a fair bit of, of services that Docker delivers that is not open sourced, that is proprietary to Docker. There's a lot more innovation we think we can deliver in app management across the Docker platform over the next several years. And then when you think about what happens when you're managing not thousands of clusters, but tens of thousands, millions of, uh, of, of, uh, of containers, it's a much more complicated problem where the customer is saying, look, I'm, I want 
to buy that app management layer that sits on top of all this, and I'm happy to pay you for it. The, the real proof points around this is that's what's happening today. Right? Some of the biggest companies in the world are running on the Docker platform. In fact, I'm willing to bet you the payroll checks that half the people in this room get, <laughs> get cut uh, to them is actually being run on a Docker platform. I'll, I'll extend it further. The enterprise buyer wants a platform that's supported. They want a platform that's been hardened, tested, uh, performance tested. They want a platform that's certified both underneath as far as the infrastructure as well as northbound as far as applications. And they want applications that have been certified on that platform as well. Um, there are many startups that can be very successful with open source and they hire talent to help them be successful with open source. Enterprises want to rent or buy software to accomplish a job. They don't want to become professional software developers of the open source product that they're trying to use to get their business done. And so Docker's current product today, Docker Enterprise, is exactly fitting that, that need of the enterprise buyer. And Tom, one last thing. There's a number of companies that are building value on top of the Docker platform that are, my view is fantastic. We'd, we'd love to help you reach the customer. We'd love to help you make sure that you take your innovations and monetize them. Um, well, just to get back to the open source question for a little bit, Scott, the last time you and I talked, we talked a lot about um, the notion of slow Docker and you know, with the separation of the open source project from the commercial product. And this was last year. And there were a lot of, there were a lot of, a lot of questions, I think, about how that worked from, from a lot of different people. And it seems like the Mobi project and, and all that was done around that may have clarified that a little bit. Um, can you explain exactly, or the thinking behind Mobi and, and why you decided to, to take those steps and, and sort of you know, walk us through what you think that's accomplished now that it's been about a month, I guess? Oh, it's yeah, the months, yeah. yeah, yeah. It was, uh, we announced it in, in March. Um, no, thank you. It, it, it clarified, I think, for the community and, and for customers as well, where you have that rapid pace of innovation and where you have uh, technology components that, to Steve's point, can be adopted by other projects and wrapped and uh, embedded and distributed widely through other projects that, that you know, Docker doesn't have the lock on, on innovation, right? So the Mobi project kind of gives um, both the branding freedom as well as the community freedom for folks to be very creative and take those technologies wherever they, they, they can take them. And then downstream from Mobi is the Docker projects turn into products. And so you have the Docker products in terms of the community edition, which is an open source free product that does have a fast clock cycle. It's got a monthly clock cycle on it. And then further downstream from that is Docker Enterprise, which has a quarterly cycle. And so there, right there, you have three different tiers where you've got you know, nightly builds, fast innovation, community members can take the Mobi project anywhere it needs to go. And then you've got downstream from that products that move at different rates, whether you're a developer on the bleeding edge or whether you're an enterprise that needs a stable long-term support product. Steve, I know you've been on the board for several months before you know, joining as CEO, but I mean, how has your view of the open source community evolved now that you're knee deep in it? Philosophically, um, it's important to know that one of the things that concur that we really embraced and that was important at a company level, and frankly for me personally, is uh, we believe in this concept of open platforms. We believe in this concept that other people get to add value. Um, I mean, you've got seven billion people on the planet. There's, there's a lot of genius uh, out there. And, um, Look, all open source does for me is, is just takes that, that viewpoint further. Um, and, and, and so I, I actually look at this and think that this is really where, um, where technology will evolve to. Right? I think the next generation companies that, uh, uh, just like today, it Concur, Salesforce, Workday, and others are the, the, the next generation of enterprise software, there'll be a generation afterwards. And that next generation will be heavily, heavily uh, built on open source uh, technologies. It's interesting because a lot of, in this multi-cloud world, a lot of the people in the audience are, are having their own individual relationships with Google and uh, Azure and AWS, and, and you have the same situation, all, all, although in a very different, uh, different environment. Uh, what, what have you learned about each of the cloud vendors? Uh, what, what, I'd, I'd be curious for your thoughts on you know, where the individual cloud vendors are leading, or at least where you're finding the most innovation for, for Docker to, to be so, so to spread. Let's start with this. Every one of the public cloud providers that we all reference, these are incredible companies, and they deliver real value uh, to the customer. Um, I think all of them, just like any other uh, entity, they all deliver value from kind of their roots. Right? Um, if you look at just as Google as, as an example, uh, the work they've done around AI and ML is, is an important part of the asset that they bring to, to cloud. 
uh, to cloud infrastructure. Um, and I think Microsoft, um, frankly, has a, a real value around not only how do they sell and serve the enterprise customer, but, but frankly, that there's core services that are enterprise specific that can be enabled within the, uh, the Azure cloud that are unique. And, and so I, I, I think that these guys are all coming at it from um, different strengths. It, obviously, you have to acknowledge that AWS is you know, very far down the path and, and has a, a, a many years uh, worth of lead. But again, in the context of a multi-trillion dollar market, it's not like the game is over. This is like, I remember us concur beating on investors' doors back in the, in the uh, early you know, 2001, 2002 era, talking about cloud computing and nobody knew what we were talking about. Right, today, that's, that's really just starting to take off. Um, and I think that's really where we are uh, around uh, those uh, uh, public cloud providers. I think the role of Docker is how do we deliver a, a platform that, that literally allows you to, to build across all of those public cloud providers on a concurrent model. And I think that's entirely achievable. In fact, we have customers today that do uh, build their applications and run them in a hybrid cloud model on top of Docker. Yeah. But which one is the most annoying to work with? I mean, <laughs> they're all awesome. All children, all children are above average. <laughs> is there a commercial opportunity for you in working directly with the cloud providers on their own container services? Is there some sort of productization there, or some sort of services option there? I, I, I don't know. You tell me. I am. Um, I, I think there's a there's plenty of opportunity for Docker to work with every one of the public cloud providers. I don't know that I worry about monetization in that particular one-on-one uh, -on -one relationship as much as, as, as the real value is being delivered to the customer. And I think there, there we, we can both monetize it. Yep. How great of a threat is Kubernetes to Docker's growth? Like I said, this is, this is a big market. There's, there's a lot of competition. I, I think Kubernetes is, is, keep in mind, it's one component of, of an overall platform, right. right? I mean, look, I mean, Google has been a phenomenal partner of Docker. They were innovating containers before Docker open sourced in March 2013, and then has been a major contributor to the Docker project. They announced Kubernetes at the very first DockerCon in June 2014. So you know, to, to Steve's point, like they've been a phenomenal uh, ecosystem partner. And, and indeed, uh, two years ago, orchestration was kind of the next layer, and there's lots of heat, lots of excitement. Um, two years in, two years from there, where we stand today, um, to Steve's point, like it's a, it's a very important component, but it's a component of an overall stack that is delivering value to the customer for the customer to accomplish their goals. And so, um, we, we, you know, it's an exciting layer of innovation, but um, you know, in, in itself, it's not, a, it's not a product or an end solution. So. And, and our model is one that, that says, hey, look, you know what? We are a platform where you can plug and play any component you like. Yeah. I, it, the, the choice should always be the end customers. So if you want to use Kubernetes for orchestration instead of Swarm, fantastic, go for it. Would you consider supporting Kubernetes within a container orchestration product? I think uh, we should chat again later. Like tomorrow or? <laughs> I, I, I think that there's a tremendous opportunity for work for us to work with everybody in this space. Yeah. Well, we've got, we could talk up here for, forever, but uh, speaking of the end customers, you're out there in the audience. Please feel free to uh, step up to the mics and uh, we'll be, uh, have your questions for, for Scott or Steve if you're so inclined. So feel free. Scott, I, I'm curious, you have been there for a while now. You're, 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 the, you're the grizzled veteran on stage. Uh, so what, Three years, internet yeah. years. <laughs> Three years is a long time. It, yeah, that is. Internet in the, in years, the cloud 21 world. years. Well, tell us about the, the change you've seen in the strategic direction and the culture at Docker over the past three years. Well, it's... You know, it's not unlike other emerging markets. I, I was at Puppet for three years prior, and we went through a very similar growth stage. And I, around the same, I joined around the same time, where it was 20 people at Puppet, 20 people at Docker when I joined in February 2014. And, and again, the roots were similar. They were both in open source, both in roughly in the infrastructure, middle layer of the stack. And um, it, it's always exciting, right? When you join at that stage and the market is just emerging, you've got the early adopters, but there's no monetization, there's no commercial customers yet. Um, you're always kind of, okay, is this going to work? And is, is the value proposition there to kind of cross the chasm and really start solving problems for enterprise buyers in ways that's meaningful that they will allocate budget and allocate their time and attention? And then you ask yourself as you're watching this, can we build an organization that evolves from its open source roots to a commercial sensibility to build commercial products, build a commercial go-to-market that, that satisfies those enterprise customers? And so, you know, it's been humbling to be through that 
in the last three years with Docker, where we started with a very scrappy and open source centric team, and we've managed to bring on folks to complement that team in the go-to-market side, on the commercial product side. And uh, you know, it's one reason we're so excited to have Steve join us to kind of help us on that journey to really take us from you know, scrappy four years to like, okay, we, we see there's actually a business here, and how do we scale it even further? So um, yeah, it's, it's humbling to have been a part of this and, and very exciting to kind of see, it, see the next couple chapters. So you said you joined when you were 20, there were 20 people at the company. Where, yeah. where are you now in terms of headcount? 330-ish? Mid-300. Yeah. Where will you be next year when we have the GeekWire Cloud Tech Summit? Yeah, I don't know exactly where we'll be, but look, it, it would not surprise me that if the company was more than double its size over the next 18 months or so. Do you need to raise more money to do that, or are you good? Don't, don't need to. Um, I, we don't need to. One of the things that I li loved about the company is that, that it was in a position where it could take its existing growth profile and get to profitability in a relatively short window. Um, I, I, uh, I can be impatient, and, I, and I'd like us to grow faster. Um, and, um, and so I, I, I'll consider whether or not we'll, we'll raise some additional capital, but it won't change the window in which I want us to get profitable. It's the same window. Um, so if we, if we add more fuel to the fire, so to speak, it's to grow faster, but maintain our, 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 our end point of when we want to get profitable. When is that? In a short window. Like tomorrow or? <laughs> Soon. So, so you are, you are, that is one of your primary goals right now is to, to reach profitability. No, I, it, no, that's not the right way to think about it. I, I want to make sure that, that the growth curve of the company is what it should be, which is it, it should be exponential. And, it, and it, it has been, it can be much more so. The, the reason why profitability is important to me is I, I think it's important for companies to have discipline in how they spend investor money. Um, and so it, it, it's, the reason why we set a bar on profitability is that it forces us to deal with everything in the business that needs to be better. Um, otherwise, it's too easy when you lose money to, to hide the problems. And, and I think the way that the management team thinks about it is, is let's make sure we have a really highly disciplined approach to building our, our business. We just happen to be in a marketplace that, that can grow at, at exponential rates. Yeah. I think we have an audience question. Oh, we do. I'm sorry. I missed you back there. Go, please go ahead. Hi. Um, I got a question about uh, more on the product side. So what's the vision of Dockers and databases? Yeah, no, look, we have a broad vision of, of Docker everywhere. You heard mm -hmm. Steve share not just in the enterprise and the core, but on the edge. And um, you know, database is obviously a more complex workload because they're stateful. And Docker initially got on the scene and, and saw its phenomenal growth through stateless workloads. Um, but you've seen us put some uh, work into our interfaces around volumes, which sounds like you're familiar with. Uh, we have an ecosystem growing with Portworks and formerly Cluster HQ and Flocker, and, and there's probably a half dozen others that are doing some interesting innovation, as well as some of the bigs, right? So you have NetApp, EMC, uh, some of the other storage vendors uh, doing some work there. So our, our vision, maybe to answer your question directly, is that you have a, uh, very much like you have the ability to um, not have a container wed to any particular host if it's stateless. Same on, on the stateful side. Uh, th that stateful container with a database in it shouldn't have to be tied to a particular host. Um, now, we're not saying that we're going to do all that work. We hope to foment the ecosystem and put the interfaces in place and let the ecosystem do a lot of that work and benefit from that. But the vision is very much similar to what we have for stateless containers, that stateful containers are as portable and uh, mobile as the stateless ones. Does, it, does that help? Yeah, yeah, just kind of some of the mainstream databases and how, like, you know, Oracle, uh, Microsoft, right? How would that sort of play out? Well, so if you've seen the Microsoft SQL, I'm sorry, no, if you've seen the Microsoft SQL server uh, in the last 12 months, they've, they've just gone all in on Docker, and it's it's wonderful to see how quickly, both as a developer, you can start up your developer environment, including Microsoft SQL server. Um, what used to take uh, you know tens of minutes now takes literally seconds to fire up, so the development cycle on the desktop is is going much faster, and they've also uh, been doing a lot of innovation on how to migrate databases uh, using Docker containers from old 2003-2008 SQL Server databases up to the new modern 2017. And so um, now, is the full you know, data layer underneath the daemon such that the data magically migrates from host to host? Not yet. Um, but there's a lot of good work from the ecosystem going into that. And so you know, watch this space. Big picture here is, as we round out the session, what should the people in the audience, this audience of uh, 
business leaders and technology leaders be thinking about, whether it's Docker or something else? What, 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 what's on your mind as you look at the year ahead, the next couple of years? What are the, the big issues that, that are out there in the cloud that uh, should be top of mind uh, for these folks? And what, what's your opinion in Do those areas? I think some of the things we hit on before and that the previous panel did as well, but, but the hybrid is becoming the, the mandate for the enterprise. And so you, you will see Docker with its ecosystem partners, 400 plus, 450 plus ecosystem partners, really kind of push that forward um, in terms of um, both investment in the technology, but also how we bring the products to market. Um, so that's one big theme to look for. Second is, uh, as Steve referenced earlier, um, Docker's making a lot of good progress uh, both uh, from an open source standpoint, but also enterprise standpoint in the core, monetization standpoint in the core. Um, on the edge, there's actually great open source stuff going on on the edge. You see Docker on drones and in ARM chips and everywhere on the edge. Look for more monetization opportunities on the edge as well in the years to come. I'll, I'll just add one thing to that. Um, and this is really from a, a corporate customer perspective. One of the things that I, we're starting to hear in the customer kind of uh, dialogue for the first time really is this idea, and I'll just use a phrase from a particular customer. They want an atomic unit for how they take delivery of software. And, and the reason for this is they look at this and saying, I don't want to be in this position of having applications and services that run on one environment today that five years from now, I don't even know what to do with. Right, so they, they're looking for an atomic unit, and that atomic unit happens to be, in this case, Docker. But they want to take, take delivery on that and give them real choice on how they manage the, these, uh, these services. Fundamentally, this is all driven by a very simple theme, which everyone here can identify with. And that is, look, there's a debt that comes with, with technology. And that is, over time, the cost structure uh, in, in how you run your IT operations, you walk into the next year with 90% of that cost structure spoken for. And yet, there's no relief on the other side that says you have to get more, um, you have to get better at understanding your customer, at serving your customer, at, 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 at being able to differentiate against your competition. So the question is, how do you solve that problem? When you have 10% of your IT budget to go solve that problem, how do you do it? Well, the opportunity is, is to take the, the portion that's 90%, and figure out how to actually drive your cost down in that area. And then it'd be ideal <laughs> if that technology platform can be the same across both. And that's not just a Docker opportunity. This is, this is a transformation in, in how software is being built and, and, and managed and run. And, and I think this is, this, is a, this is an exciting 20 years ahead here. I have one last quick question that's very relevant to this audience. Um, how many of the people that you're planning to hire in the next year will you hire in Seattle? Uh, we. Um, you should, exp I don't know if it's Seattle, it may be Bellevue. Um, but, the uh, Seattle area, <laughs> the Seattle region, fair enough. The um, mayor's gonna throw something at me. Like, uh, <laughs> look, you should expect us to have a very uh, sizable footprint in, in the Seattle area. Um, uh, not the least of which is this is home for me, but, uh, but look, this is an incredible community, right? It, incredible technology talent, incredible t uh, talent in sales, marketing, uh, service, F&A, like everywhere. And, um, and so, obviously, Cloud City as well, right? So my, my feeling is, look, this is an incredible uh, employment opportunity or, or market for us. So you will be opening an engineering center here? Oh, yeah, you should expect us to have a fairly substantive engineering, sales, marketing. Yeah, what's your timeline on that? Soon. 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 Tomorrow. Yeah. I mean, pretty tomorrow, much. tomorrow. Well, you heard it here first. <laughs> Steve Singh and Scott Johnston from Docker, thank you very Thanks much, so very nice much. Good to see you, too. Thanks Watch out on your mic. Thank you both.